Hi, I'm Cindy Jatool, and I teach biology and biotech at Roosevelt High School. And I'm going to be presenting in this video some information for you about the role of keystone species in ecosystems. So I'm going to shrink myself down here, and uh, we're going to begin with this idea that we're trying to understand how species in a ecosystem or a food web are influencing one another. And just as a quick reminder that um, in the first PowerPoint of this series for this unit, Ms. Wilson went over these tips for how you should handle using these PowerPoints. Okay, so um, with that in mind, we're going to move on and talk about the goals for this PowerPoint. So first and foremost, you want to be able to define what a keystone species is and know several examples and be able to explain why they are <laughs> examples of keystone species. And then we're going to look in particular at the role of Chinook salmon as key to keystone species. So in terms of a definition, what is a keystone species? Well, this is a species in which a lot of other species within that ecosystem are dependent on. And if that keystone species were be, to be removed, it would have a very significant impact on all the other species that are interdependent on this one. And so in this image here, the idea is that this is a keystone in an arch. If it is to be removed, then the whole arch will collapse. And all of these other species that are dependent on the keystone species are going to be affected. Now, there are two excellent videos that you're going to want to watch and come back to at the end of this PowerPoint recording. And um, the first one, you really only need to watch the first eight, eight minutes and 45 seconds to get the, the salient points. It's a longer video. Feel free to watch all of it. It's got some other very interesting examples of keystone species. But in the first eight minutes, you'll learn about um, purple sea stars and how they serve as a keystone species in intertidal ecosystems. And you're going to love this because they've got some great stop time animation, not really animation, but video that shows you what it's like when the, the, the water is um, at high tide and the sea stars are all covered and they don't have to hang on to the rocks trying to protect themselves from wave action or being pried off the rocks by um, predators. Instead, they're free to move around. So it's really great to see what it's like when the, when the tide is in and um, you, can, you can appreciate their movement and what they're doing down there. This other film is about Yellowstone and what happened in Yellowstone when wolves were reintroduced. And this is a really inspiring video because it shows you the, um, the power of one species being reintroduced and all of its effects on the ecosystem. And it's a really great example of how resilient nature can be. So it would be a good idea to pause this video and watch these two examples about purple sea stars and Yellowstone wolves, or finish this PowerPoint and then certainly come back and watch these videos. Okay, let's take a look at some other examples of keystone species together. And it's recommended that you think back to the food webs that you made in another lesson and ask yourself what would happen if one or another of those species were removed from the food web? What would be the impact on the others? Um, so here's some examples of keystone species for various reasons. Um, beavers are considered a keystone species because they're, they're engineers. They're by, by building the dams, which are beneficial to them, they're creating a, a pond ecosystem that a lot of other animals can benefit from. Um, 
species such as eelgrass, pictured here on the right, are, this is an important organism that provides habitat for other, other sea creatures. Herring are small fish, which are important prey for larger fish. And then another example would be bees, which are critical pollinators for plants. Top predators are often keystone species in ecosystems because they free lower trophic levels from predation. So what that means is if we take a look at this graph, this image um, of this ecosystem, what we see here are the kelp, which are at the bottom of the trophic pyramid. They are the producers doing photosynthesis and um, using the sun's energy to produce sugars. And so they're at the bottom and they are predated or are eaten by sea urchins. And then the otter up here is the top predator because they eat sea urchins. Now, what happens if the otters are removed? Uh, these are keystone species, and if they are removed, what happens is really catastrophic for this ecosystem because without the otter, the urchins get overpopulated and they are munching down on all this kelp. You don't have a kelp forest. Without a kelp forest, you don't have a habitat that is critical for supporting and protecting juvenile fish of many different kinds of species. So the otter is an important keystone species in that it keeps eating these urchins so that they don't overpopulate and then um, do in the kelp forest. Here you can see actual photographs taken underwater in Northern California kelp beds. And we see on the left, a nice healthy ecosystem because there are sea otters present here. And then we see a very, very barren contrast over here where there aren't sea otters and um, there's almost no kelp. It's basically a lot of sea urchins. Let's turn now to Chinook salmon, which are also known as king salmon and their role as an important keystone species. Recall that the major question of this unit is to try to understand the factors that are involved in causing the decline of orca populations. And so you've learned in previous lessons that, that the um, southern resident orcas largely feed on Chinook salmon. That is their, that is their primary source of food. Okay, so Chinook, salmon, why are they considered keystone species? Well, they are amazing in the fact that they are influential in both the marine or ocean, aquatic river stream, and land or terrestrial ecosystems. So they have a major impact on these three different kinds of environments. They're a um, major source of food, as I said earlier, for the orcas, but also for bears, seals, and birds of prey, such as eagles. And why are they important to the land? That's because when they swim back upstream at the end of their life cycle in order to spawn um, or to fertilize the eggs that have been laid by the females, then that's the end of, of their lives. They die, and um, as their bodies decompose, all of those nutrients are returned to the stream side. Um, they don't always die in the water when they're when they're carried onto land by bears or by birds of prey. Then, when they decompose on the land, they are feeding nutrients back into the forest ecosystem. So they are very, very critical because of these things that they do, both serving as prey for animals like orca, but also uh, bringing nutrients up from the ocean to the forests. 
So here is a look at why these uh, Chinook salmon are so critical to the orca population, especially the um, southern resident killer whales. They, there's the, the king or the Chinook salmon comprise 82% of the diet for orca. Um, and th this graph shows you the other types of fish that are consumed by the orca. But you can see a whopping 82% come from the uh, Chinook salmon. Okay, now let's check your understanding of this lesson. Are you able to define what a keystone species is? Are you able to give several examples of keystone species? Think about the videos that you have watched, which include examples of the um, purple sea star and the uh, wolves of Yellowstone. And then finally, you should be able to describe why Chinook salmon are keystone species and why they are so incredibly important to the southern resident orca whale populations. What we'd like you to do next is get out your learning tracking tool and put in an entry for this lesson 5.2 on keystone species. Thanks everybody and see you again.